Hi there, James Marley here. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Livewire Markets. Welcome to our CIO profile series where today I'm going to be joined by Charlie Aitken, who is the Chief Investment Officer and Principal of AIM Funds. We're going to chat with Charlie a bit about his background, how he got started in investing, and hear about the journey that's led him to set up AIM Funds. We're also going to get stuck into some of his views on global markets, Aussie markets, where he's seeing mispricings, and really get underneath the thinking behind his portfolio today. So Charlie, thanks for coming in. Um, I might start by just uh, getting you to tell us a bit about how you did get started in investing. What was the, the start of investing for Charlie Aitken? Well, interestingly, not everyone knows this. My father was the chief, chief executive of Perpetual, and he started the Perpetual Industrial Share Fund, which is one of the best performing funds in, a, in Australian history that's been run by John Seve or John Murray, you know, Matt Williams since then, and Paul Scambugaris. So I suppose it's a bit like being a doctor's son. You were, you were involved in, 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 uh, you know, indirectly in markets straight away. Yeah, I remember times when Dad used to take my two, two brothers on Sundays to out for drives and things like that. And guess where we'd end up? We'd end up looking at Chet pallet pools and things like that. So inadvertently, we're involved uh, from the start. My other two brothers are involved in finance now. So a little bit like being a doctor's son, but Dad was uh, the chief executive of Perpetual. So that, that really helped. And you started your career, as far as I know, in stockbroking. Is, is, what got you into that? How did you get started there? Well, I actually started, my first job was on the Sydney Futures Exchange floor, picking up receipts for the traders. So I started right at the bottom of the, bottom of the pile. But the great thing about the Sydney Futures Exchange floor was it was open outcry and it was pure supply demand, psychology, stop losses. It was a pure market in the days when everything was you know, uh, traded by humans, but not screen traded. So that was a great start. Luckily, when I was young, uh, one of the traders there fell, not luckily fell ill, but someone left the business and I got a job as the, I was given the job as the head spy trader for Ord Manette. And then it went from there and then Ord Manette asked me whether I wanted to be a stockbroker and then I went to be a stockbroker at County NetWest. So it all started from there. So it all started quite young for me. It was all when I was sort of 21 or so. Yeah. But the, I still to this day remember that futures exchange floor and that open outcry system as the greatest way you could learn supply and demand and market reactions that you'll ever see. I still look at it today and think, think back, that was a great learning place. Yeah. My, my first uh, interaction with, uh, uh, with Charlie Aiken was um, a friend of mine who works in funds management sent me uh, a note of yours after you'd been to Mongolia oh, yeah, to write right. about a, a, a small ASX listed company that had, I think, a huge coal or potentially copper potential over in Mongolia. But um, there was quite a bit of um, personality in the note that came through and I think a lot of people would remember you for your your colourful and, and quite vibrant uh, stock notes. How did you get started with your, with sending out the note which was, um, you know, I think became quite viral at some stage? Well it's funny, it was, it was sort of by accident. I remember in my early career at Citigroup we had a very strong London dealing desk led by a guy called Phil Beard and uh, David Cummings. They were very, very strong in the firm and had a lot of big orders and big clients, you know, in, in, in those days. They wanted a summary from one of the junior traders about what had happened that day. What had we seen happen that day in Australian equities and what sort of orders had we handled? And I started just writing a short note to them. And then it just got a little bit longer and it got a little bit more involved as I learned a few things. And then they started sending it to their clients. And really, it started from there. And then I just ended up writing a daily note every day about things and ideas that we, we had seen on the desk. And really, I suppose over time, it just became more of an ideas note rather than reporting on what had happened note. And I always tried to, James, write it in the first person, that people knew via the spelling mistakes and expressions that it was me writing it, not a third, par third party. And I think, if I look back, I think people liked the fact that it was you, you know, that it had some personality. I always thought that I had a little thing written on my desk, you know, make them laugh, make them think, make them money. You know, so you had to have a few jokes and be a bit, you know, self-deprecating at times when things went wrong. You had to admit when things go wrong because people knew, like, you couldn't just not write about it. But I really enjoyed that. It gave me the opportunity to do what I do today. And I still think there's a place in the marketplace for that you know, you know, personality based or you know, personal commentary that's, a, that's opinionated that in this day and age is missing a little bit due, due to you know, fear of compliance. Yeah, it has gone out a little bit. Well, it's really because, you know, it's not an offence to the big banks, but the big banks, there's no place for a person like me in a big bank nowadays. They don't know how to, how to control you or how to you know, keep you in a compliant way. All the notes we wrote were compliant. But just in this day and age, it, it doesn't fit into the in, square peg, doesn't fit into the round hole sort of thing of compliance. But I, it does, it, it's not perfect that the world's personalityless now in terms of finance. It was probably a little bit better when there were personalities. But I thoroughly enjoyed that. There were days I enjoyed it more than others. But it did give me the chance to, you know, differentiate what I said, differentiate our offering, 
and, and be a fund manager today, quite frankly. Was there a moment with the note where you kind of realised that it had gone bigger than you'd imagined? Was there a, was there a viral note that, you, that just kind of sort of your eyes went back in your head and said, wow, this is moving? It was one of, those, one of those periods, James, where, you know, you sent an email, emails were forwardable. I didn't really know how far, how far and wide it went. But in hindsight, now that I'm a fund manager, I go and visit people around the world. Like, it was people, a lot of people were reading that note by, yeah. by, being, by being forwarded, and that's fine. That, that's, that's, that's helpful. The note that got the most attention and probably put me on the map was the first one after I visited uh, Fortescue about 10 years ago. I think it was Easter 2006 and Andrew Forrest had asked me over there after about six phone calls. I kept saying, I'm not, oh, Andrew, look, I don't even know you. I, you know, no, no one thinks this is real. And I went over there and he was far more advanced than even I had dreamt in that project. And I wrote a note, if you build it, they will come. And I actually was, a couple of years ago, at one of Andrew's... Um, cattle stations in Western Australia. There was that note printed and framed on the wall of one of his buildings. I was like, that's interesting. But I think that was a note that really put me on the map. And I think Fortescue, for, for right or wrong, even though it was a wild ride, being associated with that was probably the turning point for the whole, uh, for the whole note and probably my reputation. So let's get into it. Best, best call you ever made is Fortescue it? Well, I think it is because it was, you know, here it is today, you know. It's probably the biggest project or the biggest company Australia has created in the last 20 years from scratch. So to be associated with that is, you know, is something to be proud of. You know, I like the entrepreneurial spirit of Andrew. I like his charitable giving. I like the fact that he paid himself a $460 million fully frank dividend this year and probably going to give most of it away. So, and he's paying taxes and employing people and Indigenous peoples. And there's everything good about it, quite frankly. You know, in a country that broadly knocks anyone that has a go, to watch something like Andrew come from the ashes and build that and succeed and build, build an enduring business, for me to be even the slightest way associated with that and raise some capital for it, it, it it's, I'm proud to be associated with that. Now, it's not necessarily my greatest ever call or your greatest ever call, but it was a totally against the odds and totally against the consensus view at the time. And I, I think that history would suggest it was probably been my best call. Are the animal spirits and that kind of entrepreneurial behaviour that Andrew Forrest embodies, is that missing today? Well it is because the tax system in Australia doesn't reward entrepreneurial uh, thinking. You know at the end of the day the tax system's uh, you know, basically set up to reward negative gearing and franking credits. So franking credits come from large existing companies that aren't growing very fast in monopolies or duopolies and you can see that in the share market today. And in the property market there's an incentive to actually you know, lose on the physical carry of your property in terms of your interest versus your, uh, versus your rent. So I think the tax system in Australia actually is set up to make Australia a reasonably low growth place. There's no, if you set up Livewire or I set up AIM and I employ 30 people, you employ 50 people, there's no tax break for us at the end of it. There's no actual incentive. There's probably no incentive for me to leave Bell Potter. So I think the Australian tax system needs a lot of thinking if we're going to become more entrepreneurial to try and try to encourage people with projects and things to actually take a risk. So. Right here, right now, that's another reason why Fortescue is an amazing situation. It got no help from anyone, yeah. you know, really, effectively, and, and here it is. So, you know, I look at Australia and you know, I look at how we're set up and this drive for dividends and franking credits and high payout ratios, and that's not how you grow an economy. Yeah. Let's flip it on its head. Uh, what's, what's, what would you put down as your single worst call? Oh, forgetting to take profits in BHP at $50. I think I was still cheerleading those and they fell to 14 Yeah forgetting to sort of get off the resource cycle at the absolute top and arguably not having enough cash in, you know, cash or recommendations into the GFC when it was pretty obvious what was, what was coming. I mean, but the, the, list is, the list is long and distinguished of things you get wrong, James. <laughs> if you're not taking risks and, you know, you're not making mistakes. But I think the key thing is acknowledge your mistakes and learn from them. Don't do it again. Don't do it again. Don't be like slapping yourself again saying, I've done it again. I think, you know, as we run the fund now, and what I didn't do as a, as a broker, we run 10% stop losses in the fund. If something down, is down 10%, we cut it. So it doesn't turn into a 30 or 40 percenter. That was my problem as a stockbroker strategist. You were pretty bad at saying sell and pretty bad at saying sell as a, when something was down. Yeah. But in the way I run money now with my team, we, are, we run money very hard, like in terms of you know, running the capital hard. So if something's not performing, we think our entry price is wrong, we reassess, we sell, we move on. We can always buy the stock back. So I think that's the discipline between being a fund manager and, and being a broker. In a, in a broker, you don't really have a track record of exactly what you've done. You know, the track record hopefully says that I've got more right than wrong, but there's no number and there's no quantifiable number. In funds management, every single thing you do has, a, has an effect or don't do. Yeah. So cutting, to me, the big difference nowadays is I 
pretty ruthless cutter of losers. If something goes wrong, we cut it quickly and move on. Just on the, the concept of, of bad calls, and particularly where you've got a, a public profile and you get scrutinised, does the does it bother you? You know the scrutiny that comes with having a bit of a, a bit of a profile that's come from your your career so far, and how do you deal with with criticism or the naysayers that, that you've had along the way? Yeah, look, I think earlier on in my career, I used to take it very personally, and you know that you you, you want to you know you, you, naturally you, as a human being, you want positive feedback. You know, you want positivity. You want to hear that people think you're okay, but. I think it's just the nature of the space that you have to be able to cope with criticism and differing views. At the end of the day, writing strategy notes or being a fund manager, you're basically having a view, quite frankly. I think, look, I just have one rule, James. I said, I really don't mind what people write about my views or opinions, but I've got one rule. Never call me a crook, because I'm not a crook. You know? So you can call me whatever you like, a, a terrible stock picker, a bad fund manager, a goose, I don't care, but don't call me dishonest, because I'm not. And I think that's my line in the sand. So if you're going to be a public figure, all forms of whatever you make public, I think is criticisable or debatable. And that's, that's where you should put your head at. And some people agree with you in some way, and that's fine. But that's what the markets are. The markets are an ongoing auction, yeah. effectively. And this is an ongoing ideas auction. So I've got much thicker skin than I, than I once used to. But at the end of the day, in this funds management game, in what I do now, it's evidence-based. If you have good performance numbers, no one can really criticise you, you know, because at the end of the day, there's the evidence that you're doing a good job for your investors and you're beating benchmarks and you're doing better than your peers and you're doing a good job. So that's what I actually really like about funds management is that it's evidence based, that there's the numbers. But, but look, you know, Kay, don't get me wrong, there are periods where you, you know, really get quite down on yourself where you're having a bad run in terms of writing the notes and, you know, the press were having a crack at you. Know, it's hard not to get down in the dumps again, but then you've just got to lift yourself up and focus on, you know, focus and remind yourself you're not, you're not bad. Yep. But honesty, like as long as you're being honest, I think it's absolutely fine. As long as you're honest in your opinions, honest in how you do things, you know, any criticism will come and go. Well, let's get into your views on the market. Enough pontificating about where we've been. Yeah. What's the big view, um, you know, what's the big view on the markets? What's your, your top down picture at the moment? How are you seeing things? Well, it's really interesting. Like, I think this is a hugely interesting point in markets. You know, we've had seven or eight years of un unprecedented quantitative easing and central bank support. My number one view, James, is that interest rates have bottomed for your lifetime, both cash rates and bond yields. I think there's real danger in, in long bonds, and my fund is short long bonds around the world, feeling that capital losses in long bonds could be substantial over the next few years. Yeah. At the end of the day, the world is going very well. We are seeing synchronised global growth. We're seeing double digit earnings growth out of most you know, cyclical and financial companies. The world is for the first time in 10 years seeing genuine synchronised global growth. Yet interest rate settings and bond yields don't reflect that at all. Commodity prices have been rising, agricultural, pro pro agricultural commodity prices rising, employment numbers are good, wages are rising, inflation is starting to sneak back up. It's a big point in markets. So I am very bearish on bonds. I am very bearish on defensive stocks or anything that looks like a bond or anything that is long duration and priced off long bonds. Mm -hmm. But we are very bullish on the Eurozone, China, cyclicals and financials. And about 45% of our portfolio is financials, including banks at the moment, feeling they will benefit from reflation, from rising bond yields and steepening yield curves and a more no normalisation of the interest rate cycle. So for a very active fund, like we are a global hedge fund, this could be the perfect moment, you know, where we can, our shorts will make money and hopefully our longs will make money. I don't think it's as easy as owning the index right now because I think there'll be good winners and good losers out of this and there could be a giant rotation. Mm -hmm. you, it may actually be that the fangs, you know, these so-called fangs, the impenetrable fangs, could actually come under some pressure on, on rotation into banks and, finance and other things in, in America. So to me, as a long short fund manager, this is a potentially excellent period. These moments in markets where you get an inflection point, and this is an inflection point in interest rates, they can lead to very big tradable events. So we've had a pretty good run in the fund in terms of being positioned for this. We're having a good, good period this month as well. But I just have the feeling November, December, January, February coming up, if bond yields in America go for 2.4% as we, you know, 10 year bonds as we talk, talk today to 2.8 or 3% in a few months, there will be a great rotation in equities. It will be violent. Anything that looks like a bond will fall 10 to 15%. And I know people who've been you know, hiding in bond sensitives because there was no return in the bond market will, will, are risking capital losses. So I'm actually excited what's coming next. I broadly still think markets will advance because the weight of financials will be able to offset any rotation in defensives. And I broadly think the world is advancing as well, which is good for equity earnings and equity dividends as we go along. So 
It's an exciting time. You can tell I get a bit excited. I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited because it's not just one-way traffic. It, feel, it feels like what you're talking about is, a, is um, a scenario that the market has been anticipating and waiting for it to happen because everything stacks up, but it hasn't rolled over yet. Correct. What's... What, is, there a, is there a real catalyst out yeah, there? Yeah, I think it's, it's actually, like I think, it's I think the along. catalyst actually is tax cuts in America. That's the one. If Donald Trump gets through his tax cut package, US bonds will rise in yield. No doubt about that in my view. The US dollar will rise in yield, uh, rise in value, and suddenly this rotation will be on. The markets, that's one thing that definitely has changed in my lifetime, James. I think markets only price the present. I don't believe there's any discounting of the future at all. Mm. That's really changed. I also believe there's no great institutional advantage in information anymore. You know, when I first started, we had a thing called the Herald Reader's Effect, where something would happen on Tuesday and the Herald Readers would read about it on Wednesday and the bigger reaction would be on Wednesday. Well, that's not the case now. Everything's very instant. Everything's on Twitter. 50% yeah. of market volumes are high-frequency traders. I think markets only price the present. So you can see right now with bond yields at 2.4, you know, markets discount 2.4, not 2.8, not 3.2. I think this could be like a, a slow motion train sort of thing that we get to 3% on US bond yields or 4%, everyone goes, oh, I knew that should have happened. Yeah. And then, then suddenly the, uh, the second round effects are much larger. So I think it'll happen. It may happen quicker. I think that the bond yield thing is just ludicrous to me. I mean, who buys a five-year German Bund at negative 0.27%? Well, not anyone who's sane, in my view, when German GDP is growing at 3% and German inflation is 1.8%. That is just an accident waiting to happen in terms of capital losses. So our fund's heavily involved in on the long side on you know, European financials, with yeah. short German bonds. Like this is, we're ready for this, but you just have to set the trap. That's how markets work now. I can't, and no one will be able to react to this quick enough when it happens. You have to set the portfolio now and wait. And that's how you, you, know, that's how you generate 20%, 30% returns in portfolio. You can't chase it because you won't be able to chase it. You know, it'll move quicker than you can, you can move. So for the, for the everyday investor out there in Australia, where do they, where do they not, you know, talking about the, the local market, where do, they, where do you think they don't want to be right now? Well, they don't want to be. I would say my strongest recommendation is to consider your, you know, how, how invested you are in things like Sydney Airport, uh, Transurban, Macquarie Atlas Roads, uh, APA, the pipeline company. I would also put supermarkets, healthcare, um, what other defensive sectors in there? It's just about uh, real estate investment trusts, just anything that's defensive or perceived defensive. Just because it's in a defensive industry does not mean its share price is defensive. Far from it when interest rates are this low. And some of these stocks are priced inverse to interest rates, or most of them are. So I'd say the biggest downside potentially likes capital losses potentially lie in some of the infrastructure stocks, you know, Sydney Airport and Transurban. Great monopoly assets, we get all that, but could their price of the capital change if the price of long bonds change? Absolutely. It's already happened once this year. They already fell about 15% early in the year. It could easily happen again. So that's where I'd be concerned. I think the supermarkets also look pretty ordinary as well. And they're having an ordinary day today. But I, I think it's anything that's long duration and perceived as defensive. Yep. Whereas on the other side of that, what looks okay? I think banks will do well around the world. I think insurance stocks will do well around the world. And anything cyclical, which probably leads to resources and resource service companies in Australia, will probably continue to outperform the market. But that is the greatest advantage of being a global investor. When we talk about Australia, no offence, it's 2.5% of the world. When I'm talking about this big macroeconomic development, if I think German bonds are a joke, I short them. I don't have to short transurban, you know what I mean? Like I've, I do the first derivative of it. But I think this will be a global event. I think it'll affect Australian stocks. And I think the rotation could actually lift the Australian market due to the weight of banks, insurers and resources being so much bigger than transurban you know, and the, and the uh, defensive stocks. So, in a weird way, Australia could do actually quite well at an index level out of this rotation. Mm. You mentioned before that you didn't, th you thought it would be a rotation rather than, a, a, but markets could continue to advance. Yep. We recently asked our readers what kept them up at night, and there, there's still this big bubble and big crash nightmare that they're having. Do you see anything that could really bring down markets dramatic, dramatically, like GFC style at the moment? GFC so I'm not because GDP is advancing in the world. If world economies were slowing and earnings growth was slowing, I'd be concerned. In fact, it's going the other way. We're seeing positive earnings revisions all around the world at the moment in, in equities. I mean, look at last night, Caterpillar, world benchmark in, in cyclical stocks. Third earnings upgrade this year. Mm. You know, stocks up 6% takes the Dow with it. I mean, that's not a sign to worry, I'd suggest, right now. I genuinely believe in rotation. I think we are now going to see cyclical leadership of markets, including banks and financials. 
I mean, don't get me wrong, that won't be without some volatility. There'll be down days in that as people think about interest rates and think about bonds. Yeah. But I don't think it's quite yet. I think balance sheets are in strong shape. Most banks are very well capitalised now. Most of the banks we own in the world have 13% tier one capital ratio, so mm. almost overcapitalised. So they're a lot healthier. They're much stronger, you know, much stronger. They're not, you know, they're paying out sustainable dividend yields. I mean, it's the left field thing like something happens in North Korea, but you know, or. But I can't quite see it right now. That doesn't mean that the markets are right in their sort of nonchalance about that. But if I'm looking top down, I can't quite see it right now. Yeah. I mean, it might be a few years away, but at the moment I'm still, still constructive on markets. And don't get me wrong, we all think about downside. But I just don't think it's quite yet. Yeah, okay. Um, can, you, can you give us a, a, a classic Charlie Aiken style, um, you know, banging the table, long idea in Aussie equities? Yes, well, I'd say it's, um, well, it is, it's a UK equity that happens to be listed here. So one of our biggest investments is CYB, the Clydesdale Bank that was yep. spun off National Bank. It's a classic, classic one for us. Firstly, spun out of the National Bank. Everyone got about 1,000 shares or 200 shares. <laughs> Everyone thinks, why do I have this? And their natural inclination is to sell it. Well, we think it's really, really cheap. And I caught up with management uh, about three weeks ago in, in the UK. I think it's going really well. It's a cost out story. It's also, you, it's also a chance that the Bank of England allows it to have less risk weighted assets, which would again improve its returns shortly. There's about five billion in potential risk weighted assets that could come out of its mortgage book. Yep. Cl uh, classic to mind cost out story, price to book ratio of about one, doesn't pay a dividend now because people, and obviously Australians shun it. You know, I think there's a window of opportunity where the British pound will also do better than the Australian dollar and also lift the trans, uh, translation costs there. Uh, next results coming up in the middle of November. I just think this is a stock we can make 50% out of. So that's the bank we have the biggest bet in actually in the world is, is Clydesdale. I think it's a classic one for Australians who are looking for an investment outside of Australia that just happens to be listed in Australia. Classic top down meets bottom up scenario with management, uh, good at management execution in between and management's extremely well leveraged the outcome in terms of performance options and, and shares to deliver this outcome. I just thought the presentation that David Duffy gave in, I think it uh, was in London three weeks ago, was particularly strong. And the, shot, the stock's doing well, it's made an all time high today, but I think it could probably go 40 or 50% higher under the scenario we believe in over the next few years. So there's one that we have high conviction on in Australia. Great. Um, well, you're two years into your journey with, with AIM Funds. I'm sure there's been, been a few lessons along the way, having transitioned from your broking background to funds management. Maybe share with us a, a couple of the investment lessons that you've, that you've picked up as you've made the transition. What, what are some of the, 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 the new rules that you live by? My only advice to people starting businesses is get good people with you who can do things you can't do. I don't need clones of Charlie Aiken. I don't need yes men or yes women. I need people who can do things that I can't do and there's plenty of things I can't do. The other thing I believe in is that, you know, you have to drive in a different lane. No one needs another Magellan, you know, no one needs another passive, you know, big passive fund. What they need is a different, that different returns and differentiated, uh, differentiated portfolio and hopefully we're delivering that. But you learn all the time, James. I mean, it's a humbling business but it's also an exciting business. Great. Well, thanks for coming in. Thanks for being candid on your views. Um, well done with, with how AIM is going and, uh, and we wish you uh, plenty of future success.